be ready to hear what God the Holy Spirit would convey to us through his word and do our utmost to concentrate and uh, to quiet ourselves before God so that we might receive what God the Holy Spirit would convey to us and let us pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather once again as a local assembly. We recognize there have been today and there continue to be tonight local assemblies of believers gathered in many places throughout the nation and the world. And Father, we ask that you would bless your word where it's being taught. We ask that you would provide understanding to the hearers and we pray that in the case of the hearers in this room and the ones who listen by recording, the Word of God would be illuminated clearly through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We ask this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, Hebrews, I just want to take uh, the first two verses again and focus on exactly what is going on with these Old Testament believers being discussed by the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things, and I'm going to alter the translation a little bit based on words that we've studied together many times. Now, faith is the assurance of things confidently expected, the conviction of things not seen. And as Paul the Apostle writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we are to be looking at the things not which are seen, but the things which are unseen at the things not which are temporal, but at the things which are eternal. And it is in this way that though our outward man, that is our physical body, perishes, the inward man, that is our immaterial essence, our soul, uh, and the human spirit, by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit, is being renewed day by day. In verse 2, For by it, that is by faith, the men of old, and we have a ban bad translation here, and by the way, this is talking uh, men generically. This refers to human beings because both uh, male and female are mentioned in the, the people uh, that are commended in this chapter for their faith. For by it the people of old, and now it, it is translated in the New American Standard Version, gained approval. That is a terrible translation. It is translated in most versions wrongly, and I went into some of those uh, translations last night. It, it would be, to me, valueless to do so tonight. So we'll simply give, in very simple terms, the Greek 101 on this. This is the aorist passive indicative, so it's a passive voice. The subject receives the ac action of the verb, and the verb is in the Greek martureo, M-A-R-T-U-R-E long O. It is related to the word or the word from which, which the English word martyr is derived from, but what the word meant, what a word means in the English, even though it's derived from a word of another foreign language, uh, the meanings don't always correspond directly. Now, the martyrs, uh, those who died, 
uh, for the right reasons who died in sharing the afflictions of Christ, those who died uh, as martyrs were definitely witnesses. But the word actually means in the Greek to be a witness, to testify, to give evidence. That is in the active voice, in the passive voice, which it is here, they were caused to be witnesses. For by it, that is by their faith, the people of old were caused to be witnesses or caused to testify or caused to give evidence. These are all lexicon uh, translations, various translations of respected uh, Greek dictionaries. I noted last week how E.W. Bullinger saw this very clearly uh, in his study of uh, Hebrews chapter 11, one uh, quite a thick book for one chapter of uh, the book of Hebrews. But witnesses were caused to be witnesses, caused to testify, caused to give evidence. Witnesses for what? And the Bible actually answers that question. And I noted in a verse that is not too many verses down from where we're reading, so I'll mention it again tonight, Hebrews 11, verse 6. And without faith, that is that same faith that caused these people of old, these uh, people who were uh, even they lived many years before the writer of Hebrews wrote Hebrews, uh, without faith, without the same faith that caused them to give evidence, without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he, he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And that literally means to seek him intensely or diligently. And that's how the word of God is. We can uh, learn that we're by faith in Christ we have been born again and we can be satisfied with that, and many Christians are, and they never really advance in the Word of God. They never enter into the greater blessings that God has for believers in Christ who seek him with diligence. But we have in Job some explanation as to this evidence giving, this testifying, this being witnesses. And so if, you're, if you'll turn with me tonight to the book of Job chapter 1. The book of Job chapter 1. I'm going to give some highlights tonight and then we may get into a a verse by verse of at least the first two chapters, but Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1 and verse 6. Job 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now who are these sons of God? Well, the sons of God was a Hebrew idiom for angels, 
And this particular phrase was also used in Job chapter 38 in one verse. Let's uh, turn to Job 38 since we're right in the book of Job. Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38, and I'll start at verse 4, where God is addressing Job. And Job, as we'll see during the first chapters, under some intense pressure, some intense testing, Job uh, underwent the testing in a very exemplary manner, and yet uh, he eventually, as we all do, wound uh, up with some problems in uh, the way he responded to God. He wound up with uh, some resentment. He wound up with some self-righteousness. And so the Lord is telling Job in Job 38, beginning at verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who, sets its, who set its measurements? Since you know, or who stretched the line on it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or, I'm sorry, on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So when the foundation of the earth was laid by God in the original creation of earth, all of the sons of God, that is the angels, rejoiced. And when you put together passages of Scripture, and the sons of God in the Septuagint, and I'll show you uh, as we move on, is actually uh, translated angelos, angels. But when you put together passages of Scripture which unfold the nature of the angelic contract, uh, the, the angelic conflict, and what would be a parallel to an earthly appeal process in a system of jurisprudence, when you put all of these together, something uh, emerges that is that that we gain quite a bit of understanding from as to why we're actually here as human beings, and not only that, but why are we in this room here as believers in Christ? What is our purpose, and why is there suffering in the world, and what is the the significance of suffering to? believers in Christ, because suffering to believers in Christ takes on a, a much greater significance than it does to unbelievers. And so we come to understand the creation of the angels by the second person of the Trinity, that's in Colossians 1, verse 16, who was also the creator of the universe. And the universe is indeed held together by the deity of Christ. In fact, when Christ's humanity was suffering on the cross as our substitute, only his humanity, only his perfect humanity could be our substitute, 
because his deity could not identify with us as our substitute, while Christ's humanity was being punished by God the Father for every individual sin in the human race which has been committed, which is being committed as I speak, and which still will be committed up until the end of the millennial reign of Christ, when uh, the new heaven and new earth will come, and where all believers at that point will have glorified bodies. But while Christ was being judged in his humanity for every sin in the human race as the one sin offering, Hebrews 10:10 10, 10 to 10:14, 10, the deity of Jesus Christ was holding together the very molecular structure of the universe. And had not that not been the case, well, uh, the, the, the consequences, of course, as you can imagine, would have been disastrous. And so we have the creation of the angels, and I believe that the creation of the angels was followed by the creation of the universe. Now, I'm a gapper myself. I believe in the gap view, which some refer to as the gap theory. Um, however, I am re-examining that in fact, because I do see some uh, possible grammatical problems with that. And, and uh, we won't go into that tonight because that's not the subject of our teaching. Uh, but uh, I'm actually reading presently a, a study of uh, three possible periods in which this gap could have taken place. Uh, but I am what you would call a gapper. I'm also a birther, uh, but that doesn't really uh, pertain to the theological discussion tonight, so we won't go into that. But uh, if you're thinking, well, you know, don't be talking about that, we could lose our 501c3 status as a uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, well, not to worry because we never acquired our status as a 501c3 uh, organization, and we just about did. In fact, we went through all the paperwork, and then suddenly, uh, through divine providence, I came to understand that when a church, and most churches do, go through this process of incorporation and acquire 501c3 uh, status, what they are doing is they are actually uh, getting permission from the state to exist as a local assembly. And I don't recall the apostles doing that during the Acts period. At least it wasn't recorded. So we are actually, churches who do that are actually uh, getting permission from Caesar, if you will, to exist as a local assembly, and I believe down the road that is going to cause many problems. We're going to have many problems anyway. Uh, we don't have to compound it or bring them on sooner by uh, becoming an organization that gets its permission from Caesar to uh, meet and we can thank Lyndon Johnson for uh, uh, that particular phenomenon. But uh, most churches jump on board, 
and become 501c3 organizations. I think the main reason is that uh, it, uh, in their eyes, establishes some kind of credibility uh, in the eyes of the uh, congregation. But uh, we have not, or as long as I'm teaching here, we never will be such an organization. And I see nothing uh, but problems in being such an organization. And uh, we don't, uh, uh, as the, the First Amendment recognizes, we are not established by government. And when church and state married under Consta uh, Constantine, the results were quite disastrous. And there were some in our colonies who recognized that that is not the way to go, and thank God for them. And actually, the Commonwealth of Virginia, bless its heart, has understood that principle and will not allow churches to become incorporated. So follow the, uh, I'm getting a little off track here, but uh, it's really kind of important for us to understand this. Follow the logic. Churches have to become incorporated to become 501c3 organizations, and the Commonwealth of Virginia won't allow churches to become incorporated. Thus, in their wisdom, uh, preventing churches from what churches should be preventing themselves from doing anyway. But anyway, back to the uh, uh, thing. I, I am still a gapper, but I am restudying the, uh, uh, the gap view, and I'm actually studying uh, three different possibilities of it, and the possibility of it not being... Uh, actually true. But we do assume that the earth was, the angels were created before the earth, that Lucifer was assigned to the earth specifically to, uh, to Eden, the garden of God in Ezekiel 28 verse 13, and that this was after the earth was created but before Lucifer rebelled against God. And we do understand that Lucifer did rebel against God, Ezekiel 28, verses 17 through 19, and Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14, and formed a conspiracy which approximately one-third of the angels joined if you believe that Revelation 12, verse 4, the stars in that verse represent angels, which I do happen to believe. But there are some things that are very clear to us regarding this conflict that rages between angels and human beings. And... Uh, we have a Pauline passage in Ephesians chapter 6 that you can turn to uh, or just listen. Ephesians chapter 6. And in Ephesians chapter 6 and... I'll start at uh, verse 11, Hebrews 6, starting at verse 11. Why not start at verse 10? I'll start at verse 10. And Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
Let's read that again. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor, literally from God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And that's a figure of speech that that refers to humanity. It's called a synecdoche of the part. We're made uh, of more than flesh and blood. We we uh, we contain cartilage as well, and uh, hair and other things. But uh, flesh and blood uh, is, I guess, the main. And of course, we we have an immaterial nature. Uh, as well, but flesh and blood is is simply a statement. It's used several times in the Bible as descriptive of the entire human being. We wrestle uh, for our struggle is against flesh and I'm sorry, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And as I've noted, that the world forces, and it's important to understand that the power centers uh, and the sphere of influence that these particular fallen angels, these demonic entities have in this world, uh, these what is translated world forces in the in the New American Standard Version is the Greek word kosmokrator, and kosmokrator is a word that refers to uh, those who are under Satan's authority and they are uh, delegated to rule under Satan's authority in specific geographical areas of the world. So example, there was the prince of the Persian kingdom who resisted the angel that we believe is Gabriel, it doesn't, it doesn't mention Gabriel by name, but, Ga but this was an angelic messenger sent uh, to Daniel, and there are several other instances in the book of Daniel where uh, the angelic messenger that Daniel is dealing with is Gabriel, so... Uh, it, it would this would be there would be little doubt that this is Gabriel and Gabriel was resisted for 21 days from coming to Daniel's assistance and he was resisted by the prince of the kingdom of Persia was the prince of the kingdom of Persia referred to a human being? No, because a human being could not possibly resist an angelic being in such a way. And in fact, the angel, probably Gabriel, noted that Michael, an angel who had higher rank then Gabriel had to interfere and make it possible for the angel, most likely Gabriel, to appear on the scene and to do his work and communicate to Daniel. So this is just one example of the spiritual warfare in which believers are engaged. And this is in both the Old and the New Testaments. 
And so Paul writes, with regard to this present dispensation, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. This is referring to fallen angels, demonic entities with various ranks and specialties who work under Satan. So verse 13, Therefore take up the full armor from God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. To take over the world for Jesus Christ? No, that's not going to happen. To stand firm. What's this standing firm about? This is standing firm in our mental attitude, utilizing the system that God gave us for uh, repelling the system of thinking that Satan wants to duplicate in us. And there are not many people, including believers in Christ, who actually put on this full armor from God, the system of thinking whereby we are used by God in this warfare in the angelic conflict. Yet since we're in Ephesians, look at Ephesians chapter 3. This, this is quite amazing. I heard one Bible teacher who has uh, passed on in fairly recent years, but I highly regard his teaching. And one time, or, or probably multiple times, he taught that Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 10, is really the best summary of what it is to be a believer during this present dispensation. And in Ephesians 3, verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship, oikonomia in the Greek, better translated the dispensation or administration of God's grace which was given to me, the Apostle Paul, for you, members of Christ's body during this present dispensation, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the sphere of the Holy Spirit. And I say in the sphere of the Holy Spirit because that is uh, what the language allows, and in this context, that's what it's about. The Apostle Paul received this uh, revelation directly from the ascended Christ Jesus as he had reported to Agrippa at his conversion. Christ Jesus said that uh, you'll be a witness not only of that which you have seen during the events of this conversion, but of the things in which you will see. And so, for example, he went to Jerusalem in Galatians chapter 2, by direct revelation or because of direct revelation of Jesus Christ. He received the gospel, Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12, 
by direct revelation, not, not from man, not from the other apostles, but by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. But then the apostles came to know about this in the sphere of the Holy Spirit as Paul's writings were published and as his uh, public ministry endured over a, uh, over a period of, of uh, more than 30 years. Verse 6, to be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What was the promise? The promise was the Holy Spirit. Well, there, isn't, there aren't specifics about this present dispensation that were promised in the prophetic word. But we do take on the Holy Spirit that was promised, really, to, those, to all of those who will come after the cross. But we, we receive the Holy Spirit in a manner that is quite in contrast to the manner in which the Pentecostal believers received the Holy Spirit, and quite in contrast to the manner in which uh, the Holy Spirit will be manifested during Messiah's reign on earth. Verse 7, of which I was made a minister or servant, or just uh, no indefinite article in the Greek, of which I was made servant according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable or unsearchable, literally the untrackable, that is, uh, it cannot be found in the word of the prophets. It cannot be found in Christ's ministry during the Gospels. It cannot be found during the Pentecostal era before the apostle, uh, before Saul of Tarsus was raised up and before uh, the Lord Jesus Christ began to reveal these truths to the Apostle Paul. The untrackable riches of grace and to bring to light what is the administration, not the fellowship of the mystery, which in uh, the in corrupt manuscripts is translated uh, from koinonia, but the best manuscripts have oikonomia, the dispensation or administration, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Now, if there's one word that intimidated me in this verse, it was manifold, because I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> so, so I thought I better look into this word and study it, and I hope I have the mechanical aptitude necessary to understand it. But actually what the word means is, uh, in the Greek, is many faceted. In other words, many, the, word, the wisdom of God contains many components. So while we want to, uh, we, we want to create in our imaginations, this imagery of a God who is totally simple and uh, God loves you, God loves me, God loves us all the same, and that's really all we have to know. Well, these are wonderful, wonderful truths, but God wants to introduce us to many more truths about his essence, including his essence of love, certainly, including his essence of grace, 
but including his plan for us and why we're here and how he wants to use us and the accountability that we have toward him as believers in Christ during this present dispensation. And he is actually using believers who fulfill the spiritual life so that his multifaceted wisdom might be made known through the church, that is, through the body of Christ, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And this includes both elect and fallen angels. And the elect angels certainly love it are, and are inquisitive about it and want to hear more about it. Who knows how many are gathered around this local assembly and other local assemblies tonight where the word of God is being taught. And as to the fallen angels, they're basically having their noses rubbed in it. And that's, that is the plan of God. We know about angels in 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn there if you wish, or I will be reading the verses. But 1 Peter chapter 1. And in First uh, Peter chapter 1, and we'll start at verse, we'll start at verse 10. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. They didn't understand the interlude between the cross and his prophesied kingdom to follow. And verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. And that's rather a broad sense of you. That, is, uh, that includes really all believers after the cross. Not just members of the present dispensation, but all believers after the cross, after the time of the cross. It was revealed to them that they were serving they were not serving themselves but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which angels long to look. And this is referring to the elect angels. They desire to look into these things. They, the, the original language implies that they stoop down to look, these, to look into these things. They are inquisitive. Why? Because they are, uh, the elect angels did not need to be saved. They did, the elect angels did not fall. There was no need for salvation. This, this is somewhat of an enigma to them. And what better illustration of these angels looking into the things of redemption than the Ark of the Covenant, where you had the two angels gazing toward the mercy seat where the blood of the sacrifices was sprinkled. 
we know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you can turn with me there if you wish, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. I always try and, I don't always try to, but it, it often comes about this way that I hit this passage right around Halloween time. Uh, this is my Halloween sermon. A lot of people get up in arms about kids dressing up in costumes and going out and knocking on doors to get candy. Uh, and I, I I know the you know the, I know the meanings behind Halloween and so forth, and I'm not uh, promoting that in any way. But I also know this that in Second uh, Corinthians chapter eleven, that Satan's servants uh, dress up as servants of righteousness every day of the week, 24 hours of every day. They're in their costumes. They're masquerading as servants of righteousness. And there aren't too many Christians, I think, that even know about that, let alone are, are concerned about that. But in 2 Corinthians 11, we'll start at verse 13, for such men, and that's the, the false teachers that he's uh, been blasting previously, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. And that does not necessarily mean that these are all unsaved people and are condemned to the lake of fire, but they're end on this planet will be according to their deeds. They will go out, many of them, under sin, under physical death, and uh, rewardless into heaven. If, if they are believers in Christ, they will be in heaven. One more passage I'd like to turn to before we move on regarding Satan. That is in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter. Should have had you hold your place in 1 Peter. But uh, it's easy to find. It comes right before 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. And verse 6, and this is so much what the, the, this angelic conflict and our role in it is about. 1 Peter 5, verse 6, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time or the appropriate time, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, but resist him firm in your faith 
knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world, after you have suffered for a little while the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ himself, perfect, uh, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. And that marks the end of our time for our first session. So let's close with prayer. Thank you, Father, for what you've given us so far. We pray that you build on it during our next moments together. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. And we'll meet in 10 minutes.